Um, where does affordable housing fit into your policy priorities? Sure. I mean, it goes into this whole idea that Fort Collins is for everyone and to build a strong community, you have to have the people who work here live here. It, otherwise, you know, well, you guys lived in all the different countries you lived in, you've seen it. I mean, South Africa is, I, I could talk about it forever, uh, uh, Mozambique too, but um, when you have the core urban core be privileged and the un, underserved and underprivileged drive or ride or bike or bus in every day to serve the privileged and then ride back out, that makes for a very horrible community. It's not, it's not uh, moral, it's not equitable, it's not sustainable. And in our country, uh, as opposed to some in Africa, politically it's not viable. And that's what people are feeling, right? So af affordable housing, I was thinking, <laughs> but I've been talking to a lot of people about it. I think we need a dedicated funding stream to house the homeless and to provide affordable housing. And right now we rely on nonprofits and I love them. They're overworked. The neighbor to neighbor, Kelly Evans is amazing. We support her financially and everything else. But why is that not a central tenet of government and what government does for the people, right? People deserve housing, they deserve healthcare and they deserve a right to work where they live. And that's how you build a strong community. Otherwise, you're gonna keep having this horrible income disparity reflected in the way we live. And um, I think that is the thing that's breaking down. I was at a conference in Venice with my husband and there are 40 economists at a long table. <laughs> And, you know, I was just the traveling spouse and I'm sitting there and there was another spouse there. And she said, oh, Jenny, do you think that ISIS is the biggest threat to our country? And then it was totally quiet. And this was in, gosh, a long time ago. And I go, no. And she goes, what do you think it is? And I said, income inequality. <laughs> in front of like 40 economists at this international economic convention. And I was like, I wonder what they're going to say about that. And it was Wally Tyner, my husband's boss, leaned all the way down the table and he goes, she's right. And that was probably 20 years ago. And that those chickens are coming home to roost. <laughs> and it's reflected in our politics. It's reflected in the way we treat people. It's reflected in the way they live. It's reflected in the way our mental health, our addiction. And unfortunately, when we only ask nonprofits to serve those roles, and government abdicates its responsibility. We get a patchwork of services. And then I'll just say one more thing about this. <laughs> and we get very wealthy people uh, who are giving away money, which is great because you can't take it with you. But they, why are they the ones who get to choose where those services go? Just because they've simply made more money and, and I like a philanthropist as well as anybody else, but if we don't do it through the central government, we really leave that up to the choice of the philanthropist. I always think um, of a very you know, wealthy doctor giving a lot of money to cancer research. Okay, great. Well, what if he or she just decides to give it to Viagra research? Well, that doesn't maybe serve the community as a whole, but that's where the money goes based on that personal's uh, preference. If we had a graduated income tax and more equitable distribution of wealth, the government could assume that some of those are responsibilities that I think are in the public interest. <laughs>